morning. I hope you're ready to study God's Word. If you take your Bibles out and turn to 1 Peter, we're in 1 Peter. We've been studying this for several weeks as we have also been studying the same, the same passages of Scripture in our life groups, growing deeper together in, uh, uh, in God's Word and the application of God's Word. And uh, if you would, turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning with verse 4, beginning with verse 4. We're talking today about God's people, about being a part of God's people, the people of God. And uh, this, is, this is what God, God has saved us to make us a people. And God has saved us not just to save you, but to save all of us together and to graft us together and work us together that we might reflect his glory in the world. And if you will, look with me at 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning with verse 4. As the Bible says, as you come to him, and who is him? He's referring to Jesus. He says, as you come to Jesus, the living stone, rejected by men but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen <coughs> excuse me, and precious cornerstone, and, and the one who trusts in him, this is Jesus, will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. And a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people... But now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. The central idea of this text this morning is this. The believer, the one who has chosen to follow Jesus Christ, to accept his grace uh, given them from his cross and resurrection, those who accept Jesus as Savior and Lord, the believer is richly blessed to become a purposeful part of God's people through faith in his Son. Because of our faith in Jesus Christ, we are brought into purposeful participation with the people of God. And that's what we're talking about today. You see, as the people of God, we are brought together. We are brought, we've gathered together today, but God is the one that brings us together through Jesus Christ. He brings us together for certain reasons. And uh, what is that? And he does so also by certain things. So as the people of God, we are brought together, number one, by faith in Christ who is precious. By faith in Christ who is precious. You know, we do not become God's people simply because we are God's human creation. We become God's people because we have been aligned with the living stone, his only begotten, the son who is precious to God the Father. We see here in the text here that God the Father sees God the Son as precious. Jesus, the sinless Savior who died on the cross for our sins, rose again to be our Savior forever. God looks upon him as precious. And the fact is that when we become aligned with Jesus, when we are grafted into Christ, then God looks at us as precious. Rather than as being a uh, uh, fodder for hell, rather than being a, a, a person who, who is condemned for eternity because of my sin, I am seen as precious. Why? Because I'm aligned with the precious one, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is precious and chosen by God to redeem a people, to make us the people of God. And because he's precious, we've been made precious in his sight. It says in verse 5, 
Verse five says, you also like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. God is building all of us into his spiritual house. You are a part of what God is building, but you are not the whole. Now we say all the time, if Jesus Christ, if, he di- if you were the only one in this world to, to, to die for, he would come and die for your sins. And I believe that, based upon scripture, based upon theological understandings of what Christ did for humanity, if I were the only human, I believe he would come for me. If you were the only human, he would come for you. But you know what, he didn't just come for you. And he didn't just come for me. For humanity is multiple. Humanity is many. And uh, there's one humanity, but there are many humans. And God came to save not just you, but to save so many of us and to bring us to himself and to bring us together to one another and redeem his people that we might be the people of God following him. Through Christ we become precious, not by our own qualities, but because of the quality of Christ. How how do we come into membership of the people of God? How? Simple. We come by faith in Christ. Look at verse 4. Verse four says it so clearly. He says, as you come to him, as you come to him, coming to Christ means we join to him. We are united to him in conversion. We convert from a world without Christ and apart from Christ and convert to a world where we are grafted into Christ, where we're found in Christ, where we live for Christ, and Christ lives in us and we live in Christ. The Greek participle that is translated as you come is in the present tense. And this suggests that that coming to Christ is not a one-time experience of the past, but that the Christian keeps coming to Christ. You could say, as you keep coming to Christ, as you came to Christ, but as you keep on coming to Christ. And it's not in the sense that you come to Christ and then you get lost, and then you come to Christ again. It's not like that. You came to Christ. That's, in one moment, you come to Christ, and you are in Christ, but you are still pressing in, still coming to Christ, still uh, pursuing him, still working to lean into Christ. We are to continually come to Christ. It, it's not a one-time thing. It's a continuous reality. Coming to Christ is not something mechanical, like replacing an engine in a car. It's relational. I married my wife 24 years ago, and when we came together, uh, our, we came together uh, in marriage relationship on June 30th, 1990. And when we came together, we had come together, and now we were married. But for our relationship to be presently meaningful, we need to keep on coming to each other. Keep on loving each other attentively. Keep on leaning into each other. Wake up every day and say, how can I come to my wife? How can I love my wife? How can she do that for for me? As she thinks through that. And the, the times that we've done that well, we have been close and experienced one another richly. The times we've not done that well, we have felt distant and fellowship's been fractured. We're to come to Christ, but that's just not something that you do religiously. Like, yeah, I came to Christ years ago, but I haven't done anything with it. You know, I got baptized in the church. That's usually what it means. Or I had some experience with the Lord, but it's not continuous. But God wants us to come to him and keep on coming, to to be coming to Christ all the time. And to lean into his life. It's a glorious thing that we have a living Lord. Peter is very specific when he speaks about Jesus. He talks about the living stone, about the living hope, about what is he saying? He's saying it's, it's active, it's alive, it's experiential, it's now, it's personal. With whom we are to continually nurture relationship as you come. As the people of God, we are brought together to continually come to Christ. We're, we're to over and over again come to him. And we see whether a person becomes a member of God's family, his people or not, is determined by his or her attitude toward the precious son, Jesus Christ. 
Those who come to him, the Bible says here, become members of his household, stones in his spiritual house, will never be put to shame, it says in verse six, and we, we sung about that just moments ago. Much of the scripture, that, much, of, much of the songs that we sung today were, were actually statements of the scripture that we're reading now. But those who reject him, who do not find him to be precious to them, Jesus becomes the capstone, the stone upon which they stumble and trip and find judgment upon their lives at the end of their days. Whether you are a part of the people of God or not has nothing to do with whether you're human or not. It has everything to do with whether or not you receive and accept the precious son, Jesus Christ. You see, that's what binds us together as the people of God. Those who reject him, who do not find him to be precious to them, Jesus becomes the capstone. Which are you? The one who sees him as precious and places your faith in him, or the one who rejects him, who will ultimately trip over the capstone of Christ? Which are you? You see, the Lord is bringing us together by faith in Christ who is precious, but he's also bringing us together that we might fulfill Christ's purpose. That we might fulfill Christ's purpose. You see, by fulfilling the purposes of Christ, the emphasis is not on the individual, but on the corporate body of Christ. We have this purpose, not alone, but in union with all the other members of the body of Christ. You know, we live in a part of the world where the rights and the values of the individual are exalted in greater ways than we've ever seen in human history. You've never seen in human history the elevation of the value of the individual as much as you've seen in the Western Hemisphere in our generation and, and a few generations behind us. And we so elevate the individual that a lot of times we forget community. We forget our inner dependence and our connection to one another. We see ourselves as ourselves. We see our life as our life. We, we don't integrate it into the lives of others. Very few cultures around the world do that. In fact, you can take a look at uh, our, our, um, our Burmese culture and our uh, Korean culture here at our church. They have a much richer understanding of their interconnectedness with one another. They have a, a much richer understanding of themselves, not as just individuals, but as people who have individual responsibility over themselves, but that God sees them as a part of a whole community, as a part of a whole church, as interconnected and interdependent, and, and, and that that is God's design. And we need to recapture that if we're going to capture the biblical worldview of what it means to be a part of the family of God. God's plan was not to save individuals and to keep them as individuals. Of course we're individuals, but more importantly, together, together, we, together we are the people of God. Jesus came to save you, but not only you. He came to save us and others who have yet to be grafted into his community so we could commune with him as one, as one. It is important that we begin to view our lives in the context of community. That's, that's why we want everybody in a life group. Oh, we had a great experience in our life group this week. I mean, I think our, we're starting to connect relationally more. We have a brand new group, and we've only met three times, and but last time there was a real sense that we were gaining ground relationally and gelling. Some of us had known one another pretty well in there and others had known other people, but now we're kind of getting to know all one another together. And I can tell it's gonna be a rich journey as we continue to follow the Lord together and graft our lives uh, one to the other. If you're not in a life group, you need to be in a life group so that you're growing together in the body of Christ. You need to be serving in the church. You need to be connected and you need to be here. Church isn't just some place that we come to plug in to get some inspiration for the rest of our week. That's a byproduct. Church is the body of Christ. It's the full expression of our togetherness. What does church mean? It comes from the Greek word ekklesia, and it, it essentially means um, uh, gathering or assembly. God's gathered us together by salvation in his son. 
We need to see that. And he has brought us together. Though we do redemptive things in the world, God's ultimate plan is for his church, all of us, linked arm in arm to work together to display God's nature and advance his message in the world. Together. To do it together. Now let's look at verse 9 and 10 where we see that in verse 9, first of all, that uh, he, uh, he does this that we might fulfill God's purpose and that we would be living out our chosen identity. God's purpose is for us individually and corporately to live out our chosen identity. Look at verse nine, it says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who, who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. We see here in this verse, this verse nine, so much. First of all, that we are God's chosen people. A chosen, some translations say that we are a chosen race. And that's not a race characterized by skin color or nationality or language base or culture, but a race of men and women and children who are marked by the precious Jesus they have lived in their lives. Just like here at our church. We got all kinds of different colors and nationalities. And now too, not, not as much here, though some of you are here uh, in our service today, but um, we have we have, uh, I mean, today we're gonna worship in over four different languages at our church and all our international. And you know what, we're, we are still fairly divided culturally and in terms of languages and our ability to uh, communicate together with some of our Burmese and our Hispanic and our Korean cultures here within our church. Some of us, English-speaking types, we kinda have, it's a challenge. We, some of you are growing in relationship, but. But uh, there's, a, there's a bit of a barrier. Now that barrier's not gonna last long. You give it a few more years and we'll all be joking together and getting one another's humor and everything else. But, uh, and, and we'll connect it at a deeper level. And that's, that's coming. And it's already coming with the younger ones. They're already uh, you know, connecting in that kind of way. But the fact is that we are, are very different in culture, very different in physical appearance. But you know what? We are the same race in Jesus. Amen? We need to love that, folks. We are the same. You see, we're blood. We're blood with all the different colors and all the different races. You know how we're blood? Blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. God has grafted us together, the blood of Jesus. The Bible also says, and we're to live that out, you see. We're to live it out and love each other. As, as if we're all blood because we are the blood of Jesus. The Bible also says that we're a royal priesthood. What does that mean, a royal priesthood? Well, not that we are royal in and of ourselves, but we serve King Jesus, a royal king. And the Bible says not only are we royal because we're associated with the King of kings and the Lord of lords, but the Bible also says we're a priesthood. Now, what is a priesthood? A priesthood is a body of people whose, what is their overarching task to bring people to God. That's what a priest does. A priest is a bridge between humanity and divinity. A priest comes and stands in the gap and says, hey, listen, let, let me help you connect with God. Help me, let me help you connect with God. And you see, that's what God's called us to do. That's why evangelism is so important. Evangelism is, is every Christian's task. Some of you think that evangelism, sharing the gospel with other people, is just for those Green Beret Christians those kind of kamikaze Christians, those, those Christians are just, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're risk adverse and they go out there. No, it's for all of us. All of us joining together are to be, bear witness to Christ to other people. We're to tell our story and to tell the story of the gospel and, and try to connect people to God. And not to, it's not just something we're to do. Evangelism is who we are. We are a royal priesthood. We are the body that helps people connect with God, that connects people with God through Jesus Christ. Evangelism is the very identity of the church. And then the Bible describes us as the people of God as a holy nation. In Exodus chapter 19, verse 6, we see that uh, the Israelites were considered a holy nation, a people set apart for God's purpose. That's what holy means, to be set apart for God's holy, righteous purpose. And that's, that is us. And then the Bible says that we're a people belonging to God. Now this is key. We're not our own. We're never our own. We were created by God and redeemed by God through Christ. He lays claim to us. We represent him, not ourselves. 
As a church, it's important that we see ourselves not as some organization that ultimately is about us, but we must see ourselves as an expression of God's mercy and an expression of his nature and love and message in the world. That's who we are. And that means we need to yield and submit to Christ together, not as individuals, not just as individuals, but as a unified body, and and we're to determine that we're going to submit our energies and our characters and our resources, our minds and wills to him and his ways and his service. Let's stop thinking about church as some organization down in the corner that either does something for me or doesn't do something for me. Let's stop thinking like that. Let's realize that we are a part of the church, that we are members of God's family, and that God has grafted us in that family, and that we need to be in communion with that family in in the same way we're communion with God. In fact, you can't have a full, fresh communion with God unless you also have communion with his people because that's what he's doing. He's grafting us together. And we've got to engage. You can't just come and say, well, I'll go to that church and I'll just kind of sit there and see who comes to me and who develops a relationship with me and who makes me feel welcome. My friends, I hope that this church or any church would welcome you But you can't think of it that way. Instead, you need to think, how can I go and engage in relationships? How can I connect with other people? How can I serve them? How can I be there for them? You do that, and you'll find out that a lot of people are going to be friendly to you. A lot of people are going to welcome you into their lives. We all need to engage, connect, and and live as the people of God and live out our identity. And so we're to live out our chosen identity, but also we're to proclaim our transformational testimony. The Bible says here in verse 9 and 10, teaches that we are a testimonial people. The Bible says that once you were a people, but now you, uh, or rather, once you were not a people, but now you are. Once you had received mercy, had not received mercy, but now you have. You see the contrast? He's saying once you weren't the people of God, now you're the people of God. Once you walked in darkness, now you walk in light. What is he saying here? We're to be a testimonial people. We're to be able to speak to others and to the world about what Jesus has done to translate us from death to life. We're to come and show up and say, God, I'm yours, I will live for you, and I wanna share with the world what you did for me. We need to be a, a, a storytelling church, and not a storytelling in the sense of telling, spinning lies, but a storytelling in terms of telling the truth of what Jesus did in our life, how he changed us. And then third, he brought us together that we would display Christ's purity. And how do we do that? Well, first of all, by avoiding wrong. Look at verse 11. Dear friends, I urge you as alien, aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. There are things in our life that we need to flee from. And I know I know sometimes we find we, we want to flee from those things. We find ourselves doing them anyway. Paul talked about that in Romans. But we need to then confess and repent and turn and, and, and walk a different way. We need to avoid the wrong. There's some of you that have weaknesses to certain sins. You need to stay away from the things that suck you in to the vortex of those transgressions. We need to order our lives in ways that we avoid the wrong. That we avoid the wrong. And then secondly then, that we do right. That we do right. Verse 12 says, live such good lives among the pagans that though they may accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify the God, glorify God on the day he visits. We gotta live our lives saying, what can I do right for you, Jesus, today? What can I do as an expression of your love? What can I do, what can I do, what can I do? Be not worry and well-doing, Paul says in Galatians. God calls us to live for him. My friends, we are the people of God. We ought to love each other and love the Lord, and we ought to live for him, reflecting his glory in the world. I ask you this question. Are you a member of the family of God? Have you trusted in Jesus and in Jesus alone for your sins? Have you been baptized in his name and, and, and visibly connected to the body of Christ through the church? Have you done that? If not, would you do it today? 
Today could be your first day as a child of God in the family of God, as a part of the people of God, the holy nation, the, the royal priesthood, the house that he's building. I'd like everybody to bow their head and close their eyes. And for just a moment, if, you, if you're somebody today that says, you know what, I, I've never really yielded to Christ. I've never become a part of the family of God. Then I want to encourage you to pray this prayer with me right now. Just say, Lord Jesus, I know I've sinned. And I need a savior. And so I repent of my sin and I turn to Jesus as my savior and Lord. I give you my life. And I accept your forgiveness and grace in Jesus. And I determine that I will follow Christ all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen.